Um, the way it was figured out is mostly through very keen observation of recent systems, how they behave, and, and through modeling, uh, uh, forward modeling. And the uh, problem is that these sedimentary systems, they change through time, a time scale that is really beyond mankind. It takes tens of thousands of years for these changes to take place. And so uh, that's why it took such a long time for people really to figure that out. On this <coughs> previous slide here, I show, I show a, a, a very, very simple sketch of what happens when sea level changes through time. And so what you have is, yeah, you, huh? what, what happens through time is that uh, systems develop uh, as a function of, uh, of sea level changes. And so here I show you uh, a system that is a, a, a function, a, a, a barrier system or a coastal system as a function of the changes in sea level. So sea levels go up and down depending on uh, temperatures, global temperatures. Are we now in a high or low temperature time? Low? Who is for low? Who is for high? All right. Is that a hand up? You can still win a point, you know? <laughs> Nothing to lose. Well, it's high. It's almost at an all-time high right now. Most of the shelves are actually underwater. Most of the ice has melted. There's still some left in Antarctica, but it is very, very high right now. Excuse me? No, the sea level. I asked if the sea level is high or low. And the answer is the sea level is very high now, right? Uh, it's been much, much lower. Some of you, is anybody from Egypt here? No? Somebody from France, maybe? No? Um, not from Greece, but that's not very, a very good example. Uh, 100,000 years ago, or 50,000 years ago, the sea level was about 200 meters lower. 200 meters lower. And so the River Nile, for example, had a, uh, a valley, a carved valley, in the present city of Cairo that's about 200 meters deep. And it's all filled in now. You don't see it, right? Now, of course, in the Mediterranean, even more dramatic things happened because the Mediterranean at one time actually dried up. And that's in the Messinian time, right? Some of you may have heard of it. But the, the Mediterranean basically was a desert. It's actually a book written by a, a famous geologist when the Mediterranean was a desert. It's very interesting to read. Uh, es essentially what happened was the Strait of Gibraltar was closed and the river water that comes into the Mediterranean is not enough to offset, offset uh, evaporation. And so within about a few hundred thousand years time, the Mediterranean essentially dried up, not completely. There were still puddles in the center. But that's what happened. So then the, the sea level in the Mediterranean was about three kilometers lower than now. In fact, the valley below Cairo is not just 200 meters deep, it's actually three kilometers deep. It's been figured out as seismic, right? It's been cut in there, and you find in Greece, for example, you also find that, but you don't have many big rivers, so it's not, very, not, not, that, not that obvious. But the River Bar, for example, it's also been cut very deep. The Rhone, very deep, you know, and uh, some of you, the, the Swiss guys, you know, the lakes in, the, in southern Switzerland, right? They're all remnants from that time, right? And they've, they've been filled in later on, but they're basically very deeply incised valleys turned it all the way to the Mediterranean through the Po Plain, right? The Po Plain's filled up since, and these lakes are now dammed with moraines from glaciers, but below them are very, very deep valleys, like one to two and sometimes to three kilometers deep, yeah? So sea level changes dramatically affect how, how sediments are dispersed. You can imagine when the River Nile is three kilometers deep and below Cairo, in a very, very steep gorge, right, then the sedimentation doesn't take place in, in present-day Nile Delta. 
it goes the sediments coming in from the interior of Africa goes ways out into the center of, of the Mediterranean yeah and so what I show you here is a much less dramatic uh, picture so this is the coastline here of the, uh, the sea level and this is the coast and what we see here is essentially uh, a development of this coast through time and so what happens is the sea level is rising in this case here uh, it was actually at one time here and that it was rising through time and at the same time sediment came in and the sediment rate of sedimentation was just about equal to the rise in sea level and so what happens is or a little little smaller there was actually more sediment coming in so the the coast line actually prograded just a little bit the the, uh, the, the case where we have exact uh, equality between the two is shown here so the sea level was here the coastline was here the sea level was here the coastline was here roughly a vertical development so things are stacked up vertically on top of each other right uh, and uh, what happens is when that's not enough then you see here then you know the sea level rises and, and the, uh, the, the, the sediment is not enough and so there is actually a regression of the coastline so at this point here the coastline was here the sea level was here the coastline was here but the it was it was subsequently going up and the sediment uh, supply from the land wasn't enough to actually uh, keep or maintain the coastline at that level and so it actually was regressing and then it was regressing or regressing so at this point here the coastline was here and through time it was uh, retrograding to this point here and that's the situation we are in here. So the sea level was rising, right? But in our case, the Netherlands here, there was plenty of sediment coming in from the Alps to actually make the sea level grow out into the North Sea. So we are dealing with this case here in the Netherlands. That's why the Netherlands grew from you know, 100,000 years ago ways out into the North Sea. It's basically one big delta. Right, so that's where the Netherlands are, right up here. Yeah, that's when you get a lot of sediment supply. When you don't have sediment supply, then you're getting inundated, right? And that's the case with most countries. They slowly get inundated, right, due to the rising sea level. All right. So, <clears throat> but I, I told you, you know, this is really something that has been clarified by by modeling and so here we are actually very active in, in doing research on this here in, in, in the geology group and, and this is a software called Barsim which I'll show you in a minute and uh, I hope I see that, let's see uh, I want to see the bar below and I'm not sure I'm going to see that so I can actually show you the very slow all right, here we go. Okay, so what we have here is this is a strongly exaggerated slope here into the sea. So this is land, and this is the sea, and the sea level at this point is somewhere here, and we have lots of sand ac accumulating right here. And these little towers here, these are actually future wells to be drilled, so don't mind them at this point, right? Just watch what happens to the development here in sand. And what the colors mean is the red and yellowish colors are coarse grained and blue and purple are fine grained. All right, so we'll walk through time. And what happens through time is the sea levels going up and down. Okay? Can you have a rustic sign, as you believe? Okay, so we're, uh, we start the whole thing, hopefully. All right, what happens here? It's just sand being piled up, right? There's actually the sea level stays pretty much where it is. More and more sand comes in. And what we're developing is, how is this called? When it's on land, right on the coast, how do you call it? It's a coastal dune. And when it's offshore? Sandbar. It's a sandbar or a barrier bar, okay? So we have both here, right? For those of you who have never been to the coast here, go to the Hague, to the north of the Hague, you see very nice dunes, and when you go to the, the Wadden Islands, you see these barrier bars offshore. They're very nice to visit, by the way, particularly in the summer. 
Okay? We move on, and now what happens is we drop the sea level. Now, I'm not, I'm not showing the sea level, but now it was actually up here, and now I drop it to about down here. And what happens is the whole thing gets shifted. The sand accumulates further down. And now I leave it there, and the sea level will slowly rise after that. And so what happens is the sand, the coarse sand, accumulates along the coastal bar and it will move back towards the previous sand dune and below we see a lagoon develop. So this here is the situation we have right now here. We have the sand dunes on the coast, then we have a, a little lagoon and then we have some offshore bars. Some of them are above sea level, so they're islands and some of them are below sea level. Yeah? We start changing, so think of this as being every time the sea level drops, think of this being an ice age. Does anybody know how many ice ages we've had in the last 10 million years? Roughly. One, two, three, ten. Yeah, it's a, it's a little more than ten, ten, probably. It's not clear at which point actually you call it an ice age, but it's a little over ten. All right? And so we've had these cycles in the past many, many times, all right? And we're right in between ice ages now. That's why the sea level's high, yeah? Okay, so the sand's been accumulating there. It's filling in the lagoon. And now we drop the sea level again. So it's getting colder. Where does the sand deposition move? It moves down again. So the coast, the, 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 the sea level's down here again. And we start building up this barrier bar. It's accumulating sand and sand. The sea level rises again because it's getting warmer. And here we are. And we repeat the whole thing again. We drop the sea level. And then it's rising slowly again and the sand rises with it. The sand deposition rises with it. Just a very simple 1 or 2D simulation. Now what's the end result? We have sand bodies. So just look at the red ones, right? This is highly exaggerated. So in nature, these layers would actually look horizontal because this is many kilometers here, and that's only about 10 meters or so, or 20 meters. Yeah? So it's about 10 times exaggerated at least. I don't know, it actually should say that somewhere. And if you look at these sands, then you see how... They are complicated. They are actually fairly coarse here, and then as you go down and out into the sea, they get finer and finer grained. If you go very far out, then they're extremely fine grained. They're in this purple color here, yeah? But what's more confusing, and that's why the wells are there, you see, if you look at the wells here, now, and I'm not sure I finished it all the way. I think I should go a little further. Let's go. Yes, let's build this out. Okay, here we, here we are. All right, so these are actually wells drilled through that. And what you see is they're logs. There's, each one of these logs is like a gamma ray log. It's coarse, fine, coarse, fine, coarse, fine. And the coarsening, these, these coarse uh, layers here, sand layers, are actually coarsening upwards. In other words, internally, you start with relatively fine grained sand, and then it's getting coarser towards the top. Okay, and so now imagine you are the person who was in charge of drilling these three wells, and they're about one kilometer apart. And you are supposed to correlate now these sands, right? You know nothing. You know nothing about this system. All you know is some coastal sands, right? And now somebody tells you, all right, let's correlate these sands so we know wh which are the reservoir layers. So you see this sand here, and then you're probably tempted to correlate it with this sand here, and this one perhaps with this one here, and this one with this one here, and this one with this one here, right? It all looks very good. Just forget about the colors now. Just look at these curves behind, the black curves, right? So that looks very good. Well, of course, because you don't have a dynamic system behind an understanding of the, of, of the sedimentary system, this correlation is wrong. The correlation goes as shown by these colors here. So actually, this sand up here in this well is actually this sand down here in this well, right? 
So it is a very oblique and complex correlation that you can only correctly make when you understand how the system works. Yeah? Why is that important? Why do I bother you with this? I'm just wasting your morning time or what? No, because these are reservoir units and they are separated by finer grained material and those are barriers, flow barriers. So you better understand what the internal architecture of this reservoir is. Right? And these things, sometimes we can see them on the seismic, sometimes we can't. All we see on the seismic, sometimes, is just the ensemble of this whole thing here. We see an envelope. And we know that internally it's actually more complicated. And when we drill through them, that's what we get. And then we have to have a dynamic system that actually lets us interpret the envelope and the well knocks to make sense out of it. Right? And so that's why I'm showing you this, because internal architectures are sometimes very complicated, but if you understand the dynamics of the system, they may actually be quite a bit easier to understand. Yes, please? It moves out into, towards the sea. The sea level drops. When the sea level drops, you have a sloping surface. When the sea level drops, then the, the coastline moves out towards the sea. And so that's where most sand deposition will take place. Yeah? And when it rises again, it moves back up. That's pretty much what I just tried to show you here. Right? You're moving up and down, up and down, and in the way you're actually building out, building the coastline out. Yeah? Okay. So, here is the fast version of it, and then we move on to some prettier, this is muddy and sandy, right? Most people, when they go on vacation, they prefer to go to the tropics. And in the tropics, that's where we find carbonate deposition, a lot of carbonate deposition. And so those are the sands when you lie out on the beach, they kind of stick on your butt, right? Whereas the sand grains, the quartz grains, they don't really stick all that well. So that's the main difference between the two. Of course, they have also that, and that has to do with the nature of the grains, which we'll see in a minute. But they're biogenic. Carbonates are biogenic. They are formed generated in areas where there's a lot of productivity and so a lot of biogenic productivity and these so remember the phytoplankton the phytoplankton has, has skeletons skeletons are very often made of carbonates and that's the, what, what how the carbonates get generated most of the carbonate gets generated that way and so <clears throat> these critters, they don't like really to live around muddy, in muddy waters. They like clear waters, because otherwise their pores get plugged. And so you don't find them, you find them in colder waters or muddier waters. You find them in colder waters, but you don't find them in muddier waters. And so very often carbonates don't have a lot of clay. And that's very good. Because that means, we see clay, we looked at it, what clays do to reservoirs, right? We said, yeah, they clog the pores. They're sitting in the pore space and they're reducing the permeability. And then it even depends a lot on which, which clay type you have. Some of these clays are really nasty. They can reduce your permeability by four orders of magnitudes. We've seen a slide like that, right? Well, here, we don't really have that problem, right? We have nice, nice carbonate shelves. They look like this here. You see, this is different from what we just looked at, these, these coastal sands, because here most productivity takes place in the sea. This, this is where the sediment grows. It doesn't come from the land and gets flushed in. No, it's in here. There's all kinds of animals and plants that create, uh, create carbonate in many, many different ways. And, of course, the one that's most famous to you, I guess, are corals and corals build reefs. And so that's what we call a so-called differentiated shelf. You see, this is all shelf. Shelf is the part of the continents that are underwater, right? We, we remember that, okay? So this is all shallow water. And if you have a reefal buildup by algae, 
then that builds effectively <coughs> builds a barrier, a reef. They like corals, they like, they like it out there where there are waves, where a lot of nutrients come in and so forth. They don't like to be close to the beach. They like to be a little bit further out, right? And so that's where they build their reefs, okay? And so what that creates is a back reef zone, which is a lagoon, right? There's very famous lagoons in this world that are created that way. I'll show you a few in a, in a minute, right? And so in that lagoon, it's usually very quiet. It's very good for windsurfing, but the waves are usually very quiet, all right? And so that's very good. And there's very fine-grained, we'll see that in many very fine-grained carbonates deposited here. Here we have a lot of wave action, the waves break, it's very dangerous to go swimming there. Right? It's very good for diving, but you, all, you have to watch out, of course, because there can be very, very nasty waves coming from, from offshore. And so there's a lot of debris falling down here in front of the reef, and that's what we call the talus slope, the four reef area, and that's very, very good for creating you know, broken up pieces of, of carbonates that actually creates very nice uh, reservoir rocks ultimately. And then the further we go down here, down into deeper water, the finer grained it becomes again. So this is not unlike a sandy barrier bar, right? If we have a, 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 like what we've seen before, you know, if the sea level changes, then we might actually have a barrier bar that remains out there in the sea, right? And behind that we have a lagoon, we just saw that, right? But this is a completely different origin, right? This has been built by organisms. And it's not by, it's not, you know, when the sea level changes here, what happens? Sand will be top deposited? No, no, we're in a carbonate system now. Yeah? Yeah? And what do the corals think of that? When the sea level changes, you know, by 200 meters. <laughs> Yes, it depends how fast it is. Most of the time what happens is they actually drown. Right? That's, we know that from geological times, you know, from geological records. Essentially they drown. What they have to do is they have to build a new system further inland. Right? When the sea level rises, right, their main area, the best area to live, has actually moved towards the land. And so they have to, to move. Right? But if it rises too fast, you know, corals are not very mobile, right? It takes them a while to actually build a new reef, yeah? Same thing when the sea level drops. What happens? They die immediately. It's the most natural thing. It happened many, many times over geological time because then they have to move out towards the sea. So these reef belts and their associated, you know, types of deposits, they constantly move. Right? But they don't move in a continuous fashion like we've seen with the, uh, with the sands because they're not mobile. These, these belts are not mobile. You can't just move a reef slowly. Right? You can't do that. No, they're fixed. Right? And so when they, they slowly die when the sea level drops and then slowly they have to build up a new reef further out where they belong. And so these things, they just move back and forth as sea level trends, but in discrete steps. Now, if you don't have reefs, like this one here, you might just have a few shoals, you know, like animals that might build local patch reefs, what we call patch reefs, but not really barriers, reef barriers. Then you might have what we call a ramp model, a ramp shelf, just a, continuous, a continued ramp um, that slowly goes from high water a high wave energy here, relatively coarse grained debris uh, to finer and finer sediments as we go to deeper and deeper waters. So that bit is the same. What you don't have here is the lagoonal part that's over here and, and, and the very fine grains associated with it. And so let me show you this in a real example. These are the Berry Islands on the Bahamas. Bahamas is a huge carbonate platform. For those of you who have been there, very nice beaches, shallow water, and sometimes in between very, very deep water again. Right? And what we see here are these build-ups here. You see? These build-ups, and some of them are emerged. So they, fo they form islands, right? Here, here, here. 
Some of them are actually remainders of reefs, of old reefs, and then some sediment was deposited on it. And what, we, what you see behind these barriers, you see these lagoonal bits here, right, and a lot of mud. This white stuff is mud, but that's not clay, this mud. This is very, very fine-grained carbonates, and that's actually generated by algae. You see algae? Remember what algae do? What do algae do for a living? Yeah? Uh, no, just... Go one step down, it's simpler than that. Just photosynthesis. And what is the byproduct of photosynthesis? Oxygen. Yes, and what do they consume? And if you extract CO2 out of the seawater, what happens? Now that's a little more complicated. So where are the chemists? It changes the solubility of carbonates because the pH changes the pH goes up. In other words, it comes from acidic to more basic. And that means, is more or less carbonate soluble then? Of course, there is less carbonate. You, carbonate, you dissolve in acids, right? And so what that means is that you're precipitating carbonates. And that's exactly what we see. Due to algal action, we are seeing very fine-grained precipitation of of carbonates. You see, you think you're in a tropical island, as of a sudden you're in a chemical laboratorium here, right? It's getting very complicated, or at least I, I try to make things complicated, right? No, it's actually, and so, and over here, we're in the offshore area, the deeper waters. So what we have here is a differentiated shelf. We have the lagoon, we have the reef, and we have the offshore area here, the foreshore, the fore reef, and deeper waters here. And the waves, they constantly pound against these islands here, right? They're breaking off bits and pieces, and the animals try to build it up again, right? That's a natural course of action here, right? And the debris falls down into the deeper waters. And those of you who dive, you know how that looks like. Sometimes there's very big pieces of a reef just fallen down a steep wall, and... <clears throat> And some, most of the time, it's just smaller pieces. The uh, picture is, of course, not, not simple at all. It's a very highly complicated three-dimensional structure we're looking at here. Huh? So, and I won't go further into details, and I go to another very famous carbonate area, and that's the Persian Gulf. And the Persian Gulf is interesting because, first of all, it is a nice body of water, but it also contains the richest petroleum uh, occurrences worldwide. And so what we look at here is this is an aerial uh, photograph of part of the Persian Gulf. And what you see here is a very complex mixture of islands, very shallow, sandy islands, it seems. Then you see these, these darker belts here. And that's the intertidal area. There's a tide, a tide here acting, and so there's actually algae growing in this intertidal area. I'll show you that in a minute. And then you see the deeper waters here. This is subtidal, so that never gets dry, even at low tide. And then this is the very deeper waters here. So what do we find there? Right, when we walk around, we're looking at this intertidal area here. Right, what you see here, this fellow actually, he pulls out something off of this. Does anybody know what that is? It looks like a crystal. Ice. Do you expect a lot of ice in the Persian Gulf? No. I don't think so. Alright, what else could it be? Yeah, it looks white. Looks like a crystal. Shell. Could be a shell. Yeah, but you see here these, these, these crystals lying around here. That's gypsum. There's a lot of evaporation going on here, and the, the waters, the subsurface waters, get constantly evaporated. And by that process, actually, gypsum gets precipitated, right? And the rest here is carbonates, carbonates of all kinds of things. You'd have to look through a microscope to really appreciate what it is. Then we go down here, a little higher up, actually, to the beach. <coughs> Uh, what do we see? We see nice coarse grain material, shells, ma shell materials. We see little gastropods, that's snails, 
and so forth. So that's ca a carbonate sand. That's very much like what we find on our beach. It's like it's a sand, but this is carbonate sand, right? That's the one that sticks to, to, to your skin when you lie on it, right? Because it's so edgy. It's not rounded grains, as you see. They're very, very different, right? And then I go to the deeper waters here, right? And what do I find here? I find the seaweed, of course. Those are plants or algae. And that's what we said, you know, that's actually creating carbonate mud. It's precipitating carbonate mud. And then there is something happening in here. Well, there's a little shrimp building his, ho his house and he's waiting for food to, uh, to come. And so that's very rich in, in sea life down here because there's plenty of nutrients and so forth. So these are, say, in a very simple fashion, these are the main environments we find in the Persian Gulf. So that's a subtropical, shallow carbonate sea. Now, what I show you here are thin sections through a reservoir in Qatar. And in blue, you see the pores, and in yellow and brown, you see the grains. And this is not really what I show you here, but that comes from the same setting. And that's a dolomite, because eventually, actually, these things here, these sediments here, they will actually transform into dolomite. And that's a slow process. It actually takes up the calcite, takes up magnesium, transforms into dolomite, and very nice dolomite crystals. And sometimes we still see the gypsum crystals. I don't show you one here, but they occur, right? And then we see all of this here, these holes, these big holes, right? That's the porosity, right? And that actually is generated by this transformation of calcite to dolomite because dolomite is actually denser. So what you do is when you make that transformation you actually create pore space. But it's transformation, calcite to dolomite, you're reducing the solid volume and that creates pore space. And those are the pores, pores we find here. And there is right there is one of the secrets why Middle Eastern reservoirs are so prolific. Down here we see a thin section. These are just a few millimeters wide, right? We see these little shells here. These are foraminifera. Well, that's very similar to what we see here. You see some of them have been completely recrystallized. We don't recognize them anymore. Some of them, we still can see the shell structure and so forth. And where is the pore space? Is there a pore space here? Speak up, because you're on camera. No. You can see pore space in 2D very well, not just in 3D. We just can't see the connectivity in 3D. Yeah? Right? You see, the, we can see the pore space here. Well, what do we see between the grains? See black stuff. And what's black stuff usually? Remember I showed you some rocks? Speak up. Uh, it's just heavy oil, just tar. It's tar. Yeah? So actually this just happens to come from a zone where there is tar. Very often between the water and the oil lag in the Middle East you have a tar zone. A very tarry zone. And that actually has been created by bacteria in the subsurface. So it's uh, uh, bio, so-called biodegraded oil and that just happens to be in this thin section here. So this is a perfectly good reservoir rock. It just a pore space is clogged by very heavy oil. And you see it's a little cracked here. The tar is cracked here. And so you see the pore actually, <coughs> the pores. And the oil or the tar hasn't gone, gone into this pore here. There's a few others that are, that are open. And now let's go to this <coughs> environment here. Here's a thin section, very fine grain. You don't see the crystals here. You hardly see the grains, some of them you see very nicely, but they're smaller, much smaller than here. <coughs> That's because, <coughs> excuse me, the wave energy is lower. And then you see this here. So there's nice pore space, right? It's about 15, 20% porosity if we measure it. So that's nice. But what are these pores? How are they generated? Does anybody have an idea? They're not really like pores between grains as we have here. 
you have these grains and another grain and in between you have this black stuff which is actually filling a pore or here we have crystals and in between the crystals we have nice pores well these are actually grains that have been dissolved leached and simply because they actually consisted of a different carbonate mineral which is called aragonite which is also calcium carbonate but it's unstable and so it's been dissolved there's a little shell that has been dissolved right this is a little sponge spicule that has been dissolved and so forth so we can pretty much from the shape determine exactly what they were but they're not connected you see it's very difficult to find a path from here to here and even in 3d I can tell you it's very difficult to find that path so this has a very nice porosity but a very poor permeability and you see I told you in the beginning carbonates are completely different animals because they have such a variety of pore spaces right shown here right this is the two people called Shokat and Bray and they've developed this classification of carbonate pores so what we've seen here these are the grains and in between we have the pores shown in black right and we've seen this here shells that had been dissolved and we call that moldic porosity and I don't want to bother you with all of this here but we have seen the third type the intercrystalline porosity this one here in the dolomite we have seen the dolomite crystals in between we've seen the pores right and they're drastically different because you'd expect here very good very good permeability very good connectivity very good connectivity depending on how much really of this intercrystalline porosity there is and probably very low permeability here and then you see others you know you don't bother about all these geological terms here but there's many many different ways of doing it the only one that I would like to show you here is this one here it's a so-called non-fabric selective porosity and that's fractures because carbonates have a tendency to fracture they're actually brittle they're brittle rocks compared to sandstones and certainly shales they break actually easier and so we very often find abundant fracturing in carbonate rocks and sometimes these fractures you know groundwater will flow through them and will dissolve the fractures into larger channels as shown here and sometimes forming caverns subterranean caverns right and practically all caverns in this world is anybody a, a speleologist here does anybody like to go into into caverns and caves no has anybody ever been yeah you have been well Greece is full of carbonates right yeah and they're always in carbonates you can go wherever you want you know uh, the, these these caverns they're always in carbonates because they are they, on, they don't only precipitate very easily they also dissolve very easily right and so as soon as you have a fracture system and undersaturated groundwater circulates through them you usually have the formation of caverns and this porosity system that we see can be very large in fact I'll show you a picture in a few minutes but first we'll just look at this relationship of porosity versus permeability in carbonates and that's shown here this here is a limestone with these moldic pores so let's go back here that's this fellow here or that's this fellow here in fact if I remember it correctly it actually is from from this um, this type of rock so here we see one of these holes right well what's in between well we see crystals very nice calcite crystal and this is an SCM picture so this is only 200 microns here right that's not even a millimeter wide all right so that's scanning electron microscope picture right we look in great detail at what's actually this rock consisting of and we see very small crystals these are very small crystals they're all calcite crystal so in there is also porosity you see there's very high degree of porosity but it's very small pores and because they're very small pores the permeability is low so you have big pores here and very small pores in here so we have 36 percent porosity here but only 7.7 .7 milli darcy permeability and now we look at a dolomite look at that beautiful dolomite crystals right big ones small ones and in between huge pore space very easily connected here very very well connected right porosity 47 percent well that's a lot and down here permeability it's it's more than this one here but it's in the same range the permeability 
3.16 Darcy, right? So that's many orders of magnitudes bigger than this one here, and that's simply because of the connectivity. These pores are very well connected. So, and that's really all you really have to remember in carbonates. You know, you can have a very high porosity but a very poor permeability and vice versa. Right? The relationship, whereas in sandstones, that's a very, usually a clear relationship. In carbonates, it is not. You have to understand the pore system. And these pore systems, because there's so much happens after the, uh, the sediments have been deposited, and I really don't want to go into detail here, but these grains, they can obtain a rim of cement around themselves. That cement can actually grow rather... Uh, 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 rather well until it fills the entire pores. The grains can get dissolved. Uh, the coarser grains, coarser ca uh, crystals can grow again, and so forth. Many, many different things happen because carbonates are reactive, and so you do find lots of changes through time of the pore, uh, of the pore system in carbonates. This is a thin section from the most famous reservoir formation in Iran, and it's from the Asmari limestone. It's a Miocene limestone. And does anybody see wells here produce between 20 and 100,000 barrels of oil a day? So there must be a lot of porosity, right? Do you see the porosity here? No? No? Well, you have to watch very carefully. There is actually a little bit of porosity. It's like here. But these white things here, that's actually not, that's not poros, that, those are not pores. They're actually quartz grains. There's some quartz grains here. We see very nice foraminifera here, right? Phytoplankton, you see, depending on how we cut them. They're just little, like little ammonites, except they're unicellular animals, right? Very small. This is a few millimeters wide, right? We see a shell here. We see another shell here, more uh, foraminifera here. There's another shell here, a gastropod, in fact, and so forth. So we can almost determine everything there is here, right? We see that the original pore space that's in between the grains here, this, is, this was a pore. It's filled, first of all, with this fine grain stuff, and then with this coarse grain calcite crystals. And all the porosity has, has gone. Or has it? Where is it? Where's the porosity? Why do these wells produce 50,000 barrels of oil a day? Because we don't see the porosity. It's actually in features like this here. It's in fractures. And that's why you have, in fact, these rocks have a relatively low porosity, just a few percent but they have an excellent permeability and a very, very connected, well-connected fracture network. And in this case here, in fact, this is from Croatia, so I'm cheating a little bit. It's not from Iran, but it's from exactly the same age. Uh, you see a carbonate rock here, very nicely layered. That's because of these algae that were depositing carbonates. And this fracture here has actually been dissolved into a channel and we call this, does anybody know what we call this? No, of course it's dissolution, but there's a term, it's called karst. Yeah? It's karst. And karst porosity is where most of the uh, Middle Eastern countries actually have their groundwater in. In Turkey, in also in, in, uh, on the Dalmatian platform, the former Yugoslavia, in Greece, you know, karst porosity is very, very important. Right? So that's where the groundwater flows. So it's not just for oil production important, but it is also for, for groundwater very, very important. So here is fractured reservoirs. You see fractured reservoirs here and here and here, many ways how fractures actually can, can form, typically, of course, by stresses. And then you see, in this case here, that this is actually uh, not a carbonate in this case. These are sandstones, Cambrian sandstones the Omishrin formation in Jordan, where we have a research project. I'll be going there in two weeks, because I have a PhD student working there. This is in the area of Petra, some of you may have heard of. You see these Navatean monuments here, here and here. And we see these fractures here, cutting through 
in all directions and we see very thin shy layers here just where the sheep are grazing here right and the water cannot go through the water can very easily flow through these fractures but it can't go through here these very thin shale break and that's why the grass is growing there and that's why the sheep go there so you see there is very th these are things you know things that are quite relevant for uh, for many different reasons right and you you see that these fractures actually very often they terminate right where the shales are the shale layers are and some of them actually cut through the bigger ones cut through so that's what we study because this is an analog for a fractured reservoir okay let's take a break and then we'll continue migration, migration reservoir rocks and now we look at traps and trap is really the ultimate place where gas and oil wind up where they can't move any further and now this is not going to be Bill, in the next 45 minutes we'll go through that this is not really a very difficult topic to understand because it's much of it is really quite quite self-explanatory so it's the mechanism by which migration of oil and gas is stopped right we all know about migration we know there's two kinds of migrations but of course it doesn't go on forever and so it is one of the most important tasks of the exploration geologist is to find the traps and so for it to be efficient and commercially viable there are a few factors that need to be considered and so you have to have a positive porous permeable structural we get to to explain that to see what that really implies then we need an impermeable seal so that's imperviousness that's the word for a lack of permeability and then we need an absence of leaking faults and we need migration of sufficient quantities of hydrocarbons now we talked about that right how much has been generated and how much actually has reached the trap so we have two types of traps and we subdivide them into structural traps and stratigraphic traps and we will see what really the distinction between these are one of them a structural trap has to do with tectonic forces and stratigraphic trap has to do with the way the sediments have been deposited okay so here <coughs> we see here the most typical trap there is and it's an anticline it's called here an arched upper surface that's folded and so that's uh, an anticline in technical terminology and about 80 to 90 percent of all oil is trapped in anticlines simple anticlines or more complex anticlines i'll show you a few examples later on in this in this lecture now <coughs> So, so that clearly tectonic forces you now that have created such a such a structure right and typically through compression yeah not always but most of the time through compression now you can also look at other structural features namely for example if you're shearing a rock it might break and a fault is created and so here we have a fault a fault trap you see the fault here and with these in this layer uh, stipple layer here is the reservoir the supposed reservoir and so that's a trap the oil might migrate up here and then because on the other side of the fault there is no uh, uh, no permeable layer it might actually the migration might stop here and of course the very important condition that we just mentioned before is that the fault itself has to be impermeable so you see if the fault is leaking that's not good then it'll come to the surface remember the labre tar pits well that's where the fault was leaking comes to the surface and forms a puddle at the at the surface right so if you want this to be an efficient trap the fault has to be sealing all right and then we have all kinds of other traps for example this fellow here so this is a structural trap this is a structural trap this down here is a salt dome that came up right and it pierce it's piercing through layers and you see this permeable layer here 
porous permeable layer, it's terminating against the salt. And the salt is impermeable, we know that. Now, if the layer above is also impermeable, then this is a very nice trap. That's also a structural trap, right? Because these salt dough movements, they are falling into the category of structural deformations. And pretty much everything else you see on this slide here are stratigraphic traps. So let's look at a very simple one, namely this one here, the convergence trap. What you have here is a sandstone layer that's just simply pinching out. It's disappearing, right? So if the oil migrates from left to right here and it comes to the end point of the sand layer and assuming that the surrounding layer is impermeable, then that's a trap. So that's a typical, most typical stratigraphic trap and you have its very closely related brother here, which is just a change in lithology. So that's not a layer uh, pinching out, such as on the right-hand side here, but a layer is actually changing from, let's say, sand to shale gradually. And so that might actually also stop migration and form a trap. And we have very subtle, um, uh, 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 subtle uh, changes that also might form traps. And here we see carbonate, the carbonate layer here, as indicated by this blocky coating. And you see a very nice carbonate. And in here we have a reefal buildup, a reef. And to the left and right, we have finer grained carbonates, just as we've seen in the previous lecture. And so this higher porosity layer here might actually act as a trap. The oil might get trapped here, it might migrate from below into this here, and it cannot migrate any further because to the right and left and above, everything's impermeable. Very similar, we see here, on the upper right here, we see these differential thicknesses, a sand layer that has been, you know, laid down in variable thicknesses, and the thicker ones have an upward structure where, uh, where oil and gas can get trapped. And we see other variations here. One important one is this one here, where we see an unconformity. So the story here is that these layers had been laid down, then they had been tilted, then they had been eroded, and new layers had been laid down on top of it. And so that boundary between these two units we call an unconformity. This one here. So it's sort of a, usually indicated by a wavy line. And if this is a porous permeable sand layer here, then oil might migrate up here, and as soon as it reaches the unconformity, the uh, migration has to stop if everything surrounding it is impermeable, assuming a shale or uh, a salt layer or something, a tight carbonate layer and so forth. All right. These are the main, st uh, the main traps we find. I have... Another, I'll, I'll skip this one here, uh, because it talks about combination traps, and we'll get back, we'll get back to that later on. Uh, so what really is important here is the arching, right? And so there can have many reasons, right? It can be folding, it can have different compaction or draping, uplifting of a salt or a mud dome and so forth, and folding. So those really are major mechanisms that affect traps. Now, I can show you much more realistic uh, pictures of traps. What I showed you before was really very schematic, and these are much more, uh, much more realistic in a sense that they're actually drawn after actual cases. And so on the right-hand side here, upper right-hand side here, we see just an upward arched uh, layer, perhaps through doming of what's below or through folding, and we see, of course, here in black indicated where the oil gets trapped. Um, we can see a very similar structure down here on the up, uh, lower right with a salt dome. And we see that we can have a very large variety of different traps. For example, what I showed before, the pierced layer. But above the salt dome, the layers get arched upwards, too. And so there we have an anticline that's related to to the salt dome, we call that a super cap. And then we have, we have faults related to this upward piercing of the salt dome, and these faults, of course, can also form traps. And faults can form traps pretty much everywhere on all the other cases where we see here. So all these black lines are actually faults 
Here we have a wrench fault, that's a strike slip fault, but in this case it has, actually has a compressional component and many faults that we have here right below us is the Delft oil field. Does anybody know that we're sitting on an oil field? Right? It only has one well and it's very little oil, but it actually is an oil field. And, and it is exactly this type of structure. It, is a, it has a wrench fault, a fault that actually is, has a strike slip movement and compressional movement at the same time. And so what you get is these pop-up structures. They're called flower structures because they look like a flower, vaguely. You know, geologists sometimes have an overwhelming imagination. And then you see the types of traps that can be associated with these structures. You see an anticline in the middle, right, a small one here, another one on this side, on this side here, and then a lot of fault traps associated with it. Uh, all of this, if you're a smart explorationist, you have to find, you have to look at if, they're, if, if, if oil was trapped in them, right? Or if you have extension, so you're actually pulling layers apart, then you create fault blocks, and these fault blocks, they are bounded by normal faults, and very often they get tilted. They get a little tilted. And due to that tilt, you might actually create traps at the upper end of these tilted blocks, as shown here and here. Or above that, if sediments get deposited and you have this uneven surface, you have an undulating layer above it and it might actually again have such anticlinal structures above it. So you see there's a lot of different types of traps. And when we go to the thrust fold belt, so that's when actually we have compression, layers get thrusted on top of each other. There's a lot of faulting going on, right? Typically, that's not a good place to find oil. It's just too many faults, and the faults are leaks. There are always potential leaks, right? So typically, that's why you don't have, in the Alps, we don't really find any oil, right? There's plenty of nice structures, as shown here, right? But there's no oil, because any possible oil actually has leaked out a long time ago. So we see here, you know, all these thrust sheets here, no oil really here, but here in the front we see these anticlines and the faults become fewer and fewer, right? And so you see that here some anticlinal traps actually occur that might have trapped oil. And down here is something that's very typical in delta regions, notably the uh, Niger Delta, but also in uh, Venezuela. We find these kind of traps and they're called rollover anticlines. And these are growth faults, a fault basically in the four delta, the layers slowly slide down. There's more and more sand coming at one point. There's just too much sand, and it sort of starts sliding down. And that, so the rivers bring sediment in here from the left. And this is all, these are all delta sediments. And then you see these, these, these falls that take a long time to develop, millions of years, and they're actually curved, so we call them listric faults, and above them, because they're curved, we see actually these anticlines develop, and they're called rollover anticlines. And that's something that's really sought after, sort of like truffles among mushroom hunters, right? These, these structures, you know, they're very, can be very, very rich reservoirs. And I'll show you real cases later on. Now, we said about faults. Faults are really crucial. You know, if they're open or non-sealing, no, none of this really is possible. You see these reservoirs here, they wouldn't really be possible if this fault was not sealing, right? And so forth, and so forth, and so forth, right? So it's really under, important to understand how a fault, uh, whether a fault is sealing or not. So we call that the ceiling capacity of faults. This is a, a study we, uh, we did in, uh, in Brazil, in the Tucana Basin in Brazil. This actually is a fault, what we see here. It actually continues all the way to back here. That's, this is a tree, actually, but it's the fault is to the left of it. It just continues all the way. It's very strongly cemented here in this case. Why do we study this? Well, the Tucana Basin is a major oil province in Brazil, and uh, in the south of it there's actually fields and, uh, that contain significant quantities of oil, 
and they're bounded by faults. And so it's quite important to understand what is the mechanism that actually seals these faults and when do they actually get sealed. You see when we make a cross section through here, just about where I was standing when I took this photograph, right, there's a cliff and that's, I was standing up here, and you see this fault here, that's the main fault, right here, strongly cemented, and you see a whole fracture network that is associated with it, because there is, there is a movement along this fault, and so the rocks got stressed, and they broke. And these fractures here, these fractures, they are cemented, right? So this ensemble of faults and fractures, you know, in this case, is highly sealing, right because that's you know every single one of these fractures contains quartz and calcite cement but of course the important thing here is to understand how how and when it was generated uh, so this is one of the big puzzles all the time in the subsurface to figure out whether these faults are sealing or not okay here is a fault this is in south africa well where is it does anybody see the fault yeah? You can have the pointer and show me the fault. Yeah? Who wants to point the fault? Let me get some, just somebody back here, okay? Yeah, just try it. You have no idea. Who has an idea? It doesn't matter if it's wrong. Okay, go ahead. Just try, give it a try, the, the, the blue button here. That's a layer. That's a sandstone layer. Yeah? yeah. Huh? Oh, I thought it would move like that. Oh, okay. Okay. What you have to do is you have to look at how the sandstone layers correlate. You know, obviously from left to right or across the picture, and where they are actually offset. And that's where the fault would be. Yeah? So any other ideas? Yeah? Okay. Show it. The blue button, just try to trace it. Yeah, show it. And then where does it go? Does it go through that layer up there? Follow it? Why, why do you go through that layer? It's not faulted. You're, the beginning, beginning is good. The end is not, not so good. <laughs> yes, start again there. And then where do you go from there? No, just continue. Just continue, yeah. Well, and go all the way up, yeah. You're close, <laughs> you're close. You started off very well, okay? You're going off back down here. That's where the fault starts, right? And then it goes up to here, here, and here. Yeah, that's the way the fault goes. Yeah, so this here, this layer here is this layer here. And this layer here is this layer here, yeah? You see? And there's a valley in between, so that is a little bit confusing, right? So I just want to show you that, you know, you see these in the fields, and if you go to any mountain area and you're watching out, you will see faults all over the place. Just once you, you know, you, you know what you have to look for. You have to look for offsets of layers. Now, of course, I show this because we actually study this, right? These are actually turbidite sandstones, just like we find in offshore Brazil now, these very famous fields that are, are found, that's exactly this here, and these are faults. So this potential reservoir unit here is offset here, and the offset is, is more than the thickness of the sands. So the sands are not linked up, they're not what we call juxtaposed. So there's no connection between them. These are shales, these are shales. So this is a trap right here. You see, there's a fault here, and if oil migrates into this layer here, it can't go any further to the left. There's a shale. The only thing that really matters here is whether that fault is sealing. Yeah? Yeah? Everybody understands? I was thinking it's, it's this one. No, it's not. It's this one here, okay? So, another one. Well, that's an easy one. Okay, what kind of fault is this? Pick up. Normal fault. No, it's not a normal fault. Something else. Reverse, Reverse fault. Well, how do we call these low angle faults? Thrust faults, yeah. 
That's a thrust fault. This, this layer here has been thrusted on top of this layer here, so it's a typical compressional feature, right? Normal fault, faults are formed when you have extension and things slide down, right? Typically, they're also much steeper. A thrust fault is usually quite low angle, as we see here. Well, I must admit, so, you know, if I hadn't shown the yellow lines here, it probably would have been very difficult to actually see this fault, but uh, that's just life. Sometimes they're difficult to see, and I can tell you on seismic, they're also sometimes difficult to see. But there's a very nice trap right here, yeah, formed by a thrust fault, yeah? Because that's a shale above, right? And so there's a sandstone layer. It's difficult to see because everything's sort of brownish, right? So that, there's, a, there's a trap right there, okay? So we talked about the fault control, right? How faults control these things, these, these traps. Very, very important to understand what the ceiling capacity of these faults is. Sometimes they help us, and sometimes they pose problems. All right, so what we do is we'll just go through a few case studies of structural traps first, and then of stratigraphic traps, and then of combination traps, and then a final rather bizarre trap which we call the dynamic trap. So I'll explain that in a minute. But this is actually an early map of a 40s field. It's one of the biggest fields in an OC. And this is, these are contours here uh, with these solid lines and there's a dashed line here which actually indicates the oil water contact and these dots here indicate wells. This is the discovery well that was drilled in the 1960s and this is a, a huge field here it's a, about uh, I would say 20 to 30 kilometers wide and, 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 and 20 high on this map here so it is a very significant, uh, very significant oil field. And what you see here is what kind of trap is this? It's an anticline, or actually more precisely a dome, because it actually is an anticline in two directions, right? But that's correct, so very simple, yeah? There's a fault here, right? There's the oil water contact. And now what we look at also is the closure of a field. The closure is the contour line along the lowest contour line along which you can walk and come back to the same point. If you want to walk around a mountain, you know, that would be actually the lowest uh, one where you could actually walk around and come to the same place again. Okay, so I'll show you this, where it is here. You see, this is what we call a saddle right here. Or it's a pass. In mountain terminology, that would be a pass, and it's a saddle. So if you come from down here, you're going up here, then you're a maximum, then you go down here. So if you start here, and you go around the field, you walk along this contour, here, 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 then you're coming back to the same place. Right? So that's what we call a closure. Yeah, and that's quite important to know the closure because that very often when you don't know where the oil water contact is, that is the maximum possible level, lowest level, where the oil water contact could be. It cannot be any lower than that because after that the oil would actually spill over in the next structure. Okay, everybody understands that? You have like a structure like this here, like this. So the lowest one is where the closure is, the closure point is. If you fill more oil in, then the oil would spill over into the next structure. Yeah? Now, of course, here we know, we know the oil-water contact, and this field is almost filled to the spill. Not quite. Could have been a little more, all the way down to here, but it hasn't spilled over. So the structure next to it may not contain any oil. We move, make a little move to another part of the world and that's Iran and these are very famous anticlines, again these are cross sections across the Zagros Mountains 
And what you see here with these vertical lines, these are wells, and the name of the oil field is indicated here. And some of these oil fields, they've been actually producing for more than 100 years. You see the Maastricht Suleiman oil field here has been discovered in the early 1900s and is still producing for more than 100 years. <coughs> and down here, with its blocky signature, that's the Asmari sand limestone that I showed you before. This is the Asmari line, and the white layer above it is the Fars salt. It's a salt layer. And so what you see here is very nice anticlinal structures, and then you see the salt, but in some cases it's actually scaringly thin. You see like this here, so it's not a very good seal, but luckily the rest of the layers are also quite impermeable, so that helps. And if you go to the other fields, Haftkel here, Agajari, Gatsharan field, this is the biggest oil field in Iran here, right here. You see this very nice, what we call a whaleback anticline, right? The far salt above it, sealing it, right? This field is one of the big producers in Iran. What's interesting about this, these cross sections is that may not be obvious from the very beginning. If you look at the surface, do you see an anticline here? No, you don't. You see a syncline. That's the opposite of an anticline. You see a syncline here. So if you're a field geologist and your boss sends you out and says, find nice anticlines, and you're walking across here and you find a nice anticline here, and you say, boss, let's drill here. Well, down here is actually a syncline. That's not a trap. This is an, an, in, invert, uh, an inverted structure, so that what you see at the surface is not the same as in the subsurface. The salt has flown. The salt has flown away from the anticlines into the synclines, and it has pushed up the overlying sediments. So you actually have, uh, ha, 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 find an inverted structural situation there. Almost whenever there is an, a syncline here, you have an anticline below. That's because of the salt flow. You see that also very typically here in the Gatsharan oil field, right? And you see these very thick sand lay, uh, salt layers next to the field, on the flanks of the field, where you don't really need them, and a very thin salt layer above them. But still, these are extremely good produ productive fields, right? And when they reach the surface, such as here, the Kuyas Mari, that's where the type section of the Asmari limestone, Ku means mountain in, in Farsi, right? You can actually go up there, you can look at these, look at these, these layers, at the, sometimes, some of them are quite high mountains, right? Of course, that's not, an, that's not a trap because the salt has been eroded away, right? You need to go to the subsurface where the salt is still there, yeah? Fractured reservoirs, anticlinal reservoirs, they are looking a little bit like the Jura Mountains. Some of you may know the Jura Mountains. Nice folds, right, one after the other. The Sagros Mountains are very similar to that, but they continue into the subsurface. And there they're covered with salt layers, and that's what makes these very nice oil fields that we find in Iran. Now let's go to something a little more complicated. So here is uh, the Oklahoma City oil field. is an anticline. You see these dolomites here, then sands above that. We see an unconformity. We see a fault. We see down here, we see a granite. Now, how much more complicated can things be? On this side, we see the dolomite. That's the same dolomite as this one here, the fault. So you see how this fault blade, right, down thrown to the right-hand side. And these, these are Wilcox sands here, very good sands. That's the same sands as we have here. So they got eroded up here, right? Very complicated story. We have faults, we have anticlines, we have unconformities, just about everything, right? And we even have a weathered basement here that contains some, some of the oil. You see, that's reality, that's what you find, you know, in real life. The simple reservoirs like these here, you know, unfortunately, they're quite rare. Usually they're very volumetric, volumetrically important. Much more often you find complicated cases like this here or this here. This is the Hasir Melgas field, right? 
which we looked at, the Hasima South Gas uh, oil field earlier on. This is the biggest gas field in, um, in Africa. And these are the sandstones here. There's a basement horse block. There's the, the, um, the source rock. And the oil has migrated, at uh, the gas, sorry, because this is actually very deep, so we're in the gas window has migrated laterally and downwards into this porous layer here. And luckily we have this seal above here. First the salt, NaCl, halite, and then anhydrite, which is gypsum without the water, CaSO4, right? Both very, very effective seals. If you have a gas field, you can't wish for any, anything better than that as a seal. The North Sea, this is a cross-section through the Viking Graben, the northern part of the North Sea Rift. And we see these blocks here, these tilted blocks. That was a rift. The Atlantic Ocean actually wanted in the Jurassic to open up here, right? Great Britain is to the left here, to the south actually, and, and to, to the west. And Norway is to the right, right? That's where a rift opened in the Jurassic in relation to the drift of Africa and Europe or Eurasia, if you want, right? But that rift actually was abandoned and it opened up on the western side of Great Britain and that's where the current Atlantic Ocean is. And so this is what we call an aborted rift. It started, but it never made it to become an ocean. Yeah? So it started here at this time here, right? And it stopped at this time here, right? And then it got filled in with sediments. And so during this rifting, all these fault blocks, extensional fault blocks were created. They're all tilted. And most of the reservoirs in, in the Viking Graben, like the Stadfjord field and others shown here, they're in these tilted, tilted horse blocks here. And above that, you have draping of younger sediments, and they form the seal. So these are fault block traps, faulty traps. This is a basement reservoir in Venezuela see the basement here. These are wells. You see a block has been thrown up in the middle along these faults to the left and right here, right? And that's actually one of the very few reservoirs where you find oil in basement rocks, such as granite. The biggest field currently is the White Tiger field in Vietnam. Produces about 90% of Vietnam's production. Was found by the Russians using uh, gravimetry, by the way, not using seismic, right? You can actually get, you know, can detect fields with gravimetry, and, and that's where the oil is. So that's a weathered basement here. The oil has migrated from down here into this upthrown block and is also partly in these fractured limestones here. This is from Nigeria. It's um, more a conceptual sketch, in fact, and that's one of these rollover structures, a growth fault shown here, and a secondary growth fault along here, a so-called antithetic fault here, and those are the structures we find typically. So very gentle, very large anticlines, which we call rollover anticlines, and they are filled very often for a great deal, a great degree, with oil. And in the deeper layers, we have gas, such as shown by these lighter colors here. And the faults have actually here a dual role. For one thing, they are actually acting as migration pathways for the oil. So the, the shales down here, you know, they're rich in organic material. And as soon as they're mature, the oil wants to escape, migrate first primary migration, then secondary migration, and the easiest pathways along the fault. And so they will go as long as they can along the fault and fill all the reservoirs they find on the way, the reservoir sandstones they find on the way, and hopefully at one point they will stop migrating because the fault might be, might be sealed. Salt dome here, salt block, and uh, we see all these associated traps with such a feature here. Uh, what's interesting is what we call the cap rock. That's actually a dissolved salt that actually creates um, a, a 
creates porosity through the dissolution and that actually can contain significant amounts of oil and then above the, uh, the salt dome we have an anticline and in that anticline you also of course uh, can find uh, can form a very nice trap and anything that's pierced can be uh, an additional trap very complicated to develop because you see these are wells here shown by these vertical lines and you see that many of these wells they actually target multiple layers here and so that's fine but then the petroleum engineers and the production engineers they actually have a big problem balancing these different pressures these reservoirs all have different pressures and so it's a very delicate a delicate thing actually to produce them in an effective way and we see here a field that's also above a dome and we see look actually from the top so uh, like looking at this structure here from the top but here we see a lot of fracturing and faulting and what's shown here down here this rim that's stippled so that's actually a degraded biodegraded oil zone a tar or asphalt zone below that is the water in dark gray and above that the oil shown in white and then in light gray in here is the gas cap so you think well all this faulting how can that possibly hold this this oil and gas without is, those fluids escaping and uh, indeed they didn't escape apparently otherwise they wouldn't be there and so obviously there's a very good seal about this whole structure that holds down, holds back the fluid migration now so these are the structural traps we move on to stratigraphic traps and a very simple one here is just a layer of sand you know in cross section and in top section here that would be charged with oil and around it you know for some reason you have different lithologies or a pinch out here of a layer and then that would form a trap and so from a top from the top this layer here could actually look like something like this here but more realistically here we see some stratigraphic traps in the <coughs> Gulf of Suez in Egypt and uh, let's look at the uh, top one first you see the sand layer here and in black is indicated are indicated occurrences of of oil these are typically reservoirs that are very difficult to find now interestingly enough there's a very thick sand up here sorry up here this is the Zeit formation here and but it doesn't really play any role as a seal the seal is just the encased encasing formation around these sands here and if you look down here similar again still in the uh, in in uh, in the Gulf of Suez we see these sand layers right and some of them are actually fault bounded right again we see the salt here but the salt itself does not really play a role in in sealing these uh, sealing and trapping these uh, hydrocarbon uh, this is a map from the uh, fields in Kansas there are many many fields here right this is very large it's six miles here so that would be about uh, perhaps a hundred kilometers wide from from left to right uh, what it shows is the alignment of fields here these trends these are sands these are sands so they're individual sands they're shoreline sands right so these are the sands that I showed you this model of this uh, barrier bar model that I showed you and these are sands laid down in that fashion and you see that actually you have two trends and these are two different coastlines you, you, you see you have one coastline that seems to go like this here and then a younger one that looks like this here so the coastline has shifted through time right and, and that's once you understand what these sands are the nature of these sands you can actually if you know you know these are coastal barrier sands then you know the sand the coastline has gone this way here so then it's much easier to find these fields as well so you have to have a dynamic picture in your mind of how these sands are deposited um, helps you actually to find to find these fields um, and I can show you by way of comparison the uh, current coastline in the uh, uh, 
East Atlantic uh, coast around uh, South Carolina. And you see these barrier sands, they're shown here. There's actually, these are very popular vacation spots. There's lots of houses there. Ever so often when uh, uh, you know, a storm comes and you know, these houses get flushed away or badly damaged because this is a dynamic situation. But of course, there's very good fishing, very good surfing and so forth. So people keep coming back and rebuilding their houses. But you know, this is actually just a sketch. This is a map of <clears throat> the South Carolina coast. And to the right of it, I'll sh I show you this trend here, the, the Salias trend shown here, right? And then there is a coast, uh, coastline here. So that's actually an analog. You know, and that's why we have, you know, we think this is a deposition, no, this is a depositional model we can use to explain these fields here. So this stratigraphic traps, very nice stratigraphic traps. And we move on to the last type, the second last type of traps, unconformity combination traps. Usually they're a mixture of structural and stratigraphic. For example, here you see layers actually being eroded. Here, basically pinching out. That's a trap, that's a trap here, this is the unconformity, this is an onlap here, this layer actually stops here because it was deposited as uh, the, the, uh, these, these, the sediments were actually onlapping onto this erosional surface here and so you find traps here, you find traps here and traps here and this is a model how these things were actually deposited, all of this has to do with uh, seismic stratigraphy, which I, I believe some of you will take or have taken already. Now, we can have very big unconformity traps, and the following slide is actually from the only oil field in Suriname, uh, which is called the Tambaraj oil field, and it's a very big field, but very heavy oil field. And what I show you here is the Atlantic Ocean, the continental rise, so these are muddy oceanic deposits here and then we have the continental edge, the shelf edge right here and then in yellow are more sand rich sediments here and then we continue, the, this bit here actually continues here and we continue, we see, you see how this wedge actually of sand rich sediment becomes thinner and thinner as we go move to, towards the coast and this is the red thing below here is the Guyana shield which then goes on into the Amazon uh, shield to the left here and these are the sands that are actually onlapping onto this onto the Guyana shield and they get thinner and thinner the more you move into inland and the coast coastline is actually somewhere here. The Tambarejo field is here, is shown here and we know where the source rock is. The source rock is actually down here. It's the only place where the source rock is. Well that's 80 miles offshore, more than 100 kilometers offshore. So that oil has actually migrated along these layers here, you see these arrows? In here and finally got trapped here, basically got squeezed because these layers got thinner and thinner. It moved along the unconformities most likely and it got thinner and thinner and finally got wedged. Like when you're trying to climb into a cave and then as of a sudden you know you can't go any further and you find out that you're actually wedged and you can't get out anymore. So that's what happened to the oil. And then of course the bacteria came. This was very nice oil, very light oil. Then bacteria came because there's fresh water here, it's very shallow, right, and started degrading it. And that's why it's so heavy currently. And so, you know, Suriname, for those of you who, who don't know that, is former Dutch Guyana. And, uh, and uh, it's, you know, it's really quite heavily dependent on, on, this, uh, on this oil field here, the production of this oil field, aside from the bauxite it produces. So these are typically the combination traps where unconformities typically play a big role, as you can see here, these onlaps above unconformities, onlaps, erosions, buried hills, and so forth. There's a lot of uh, traps that are associated with this. They have a structural component, and that's the tilting here, and they have a stratigraphic component, and that's the onlaps and the pinch outs associated with it. So here you see uh, another real example of a combination trap, um, very similar to the Tambarejo field, you see how this pinches out here. This is some of the youngest fields in the San Joaquin Basin, the so-called Sunset Midway field, which is actually a combination of quite a few fields 
but there's a tremendous uh, number of wells drilled here and uh, it's extremely young oil, some of it is probably less than a million years old, some of the youngest uh, uh, oil we find. Um, also, same thing, combination here, on lap and then up here, you see where the wells are drilled, you know, that's a combination trap, there's an unconformity right above it, that's the seal, we have fractured quartzite below, we have dolomites, fractured dolomites, and they are eroded on top. And here, a similar stru structure, the Rasgari field in the uh, Suez uh, Graben in Egypt, where you see these Nubian sandstone here actually pinching out and some of the Miocene reefal sandstone above it unlapping onto it. And then you have the evaporites, and in this case the evaporites are the seal. All right. And last case, because I want to finish this presentation, are dynamic traps, and they are the most puzzling of all traps because they don't have a closure. So remember what closure is, right? So what this is, is there's a pressure difference in the fluids and that means that they actually the fluids move let me show you this so see this is static situation here nothing moves or it ha nothing moves at current and if you start moving things for example the groundwater because there's a pressure gradient between here and here for example if you have a mountain uplift on the left and then you might actually have a pressure difference in the water so the water st might start moving from left to right what that happens is it might actually displace the more viscous bit, which in this case is the oil. The gas might actually stay up there, right? Uh, it's very light, and so it's m much more difficult to move, but the, 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 you know, the mobility ratio between these two is not really as high as here, and so the oil moves quite a bit easier. If you continue doing that, then actually you might actually wind up with the oil all the way on the flank, on the side. It's very puzzling. Right, if you find that. But it happens. This is a field, Sage Creek oil field, Wyoming. It's a very nice structure, very nice anticline. You say, oh, is this a nice structure? So you start drilling wells here. You see, and you see these empty circles, they indicate a dry well. And so obviously, people have been, had been very disappointed. They drilled over and over again and couldn't believe it because similar fields actually had oil. Right, and so finally somebody for a reason that I don't know, said, well, let's drill down on the flank. And they found oil. And all of these here are producing wells. Right? That's a dynamic trap. It's all the way down on the flank. Right? And that's, of course, because there is a gradient. Which way does the pressure gradient go? From? From upper right to left. Upper right to lower left. Yes, so that's the, this way here. Right. That's the way the pressure gradient goes. Very strong tilt, 150 meters per kilometer. It's the oil water contact. So it's extremely steep oil water contact. Typically, they're horizontal. See, they're horizontal here. Well, here, it, it's tilted at 150 meters per kilometer. All right, so there's things to think about. What kind of traps do Dutch oil fields have? For example, the Groningen gas field, Cretaceous onshore offshore gas fields. What is the Kashgan oil field in Kazakhstan? It's one of the largest oil fields. How come it's been discovered so late? What is its structure, reservoir rock seal trapping mechanism? And why are the Arabian platform fields so prolific? Things to think about, you know? Just why, you know, these are things that, that are relevant for us, right? We depend on this stuff. We depend when you go home cooking tonight you depend on gas coming from this gas field here. That's where it's coming from, right? Otherwise, you'd have to use something else, right? Kazakhstan is a boom, has a booming economy because of this field here and because of the Tengiz field. Right? It's booming, right? They're building a new capital, Astana, so forth. So that's all relevant. All right. Are there any questions on the traps? No? So we meet next Friday for the last lecture. Yeah, and don't hesitate to send me questions or anything, you know, should you have some. Okay, thank you.